everyone. Welcome to Here We Are, Brattleboro's Community Talk Show. I'm Wendy O'Connell, and I am here today with Meg Mott. Meg is a writer. She's a town moderator. She's a professor at Marlboro College, where she teaches political theory and constitutional law. It's also where she encourages debate and disagreement in her classes. So, Meg, welcome to Here We Are. Thank you, Wendy. Yes. It's been great to work with you on getting here oh, and to, to have this um, uh, be part of this program. I've certainly enjoyed looking at other okay. of the um, shows that have come out. Oh, so. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we're trying great. to get lots of different people on yeah. telling lots of different right. stories. So thanks. Well, thanks for being here. Um, so you're born in Kentucky, mm -hmm. which is far away, and you uh, summered in Conway, Mass. Right where your grandfather lived, mm -hmm. yes. Can you talk a little bit about those summers? Sure. Um, so my grandfather, a certain generation will know who he was. His name was Archibald McLeish. Yes. Uh, most known for writing Ars Poetica. It's usually in American anthologies, or it was until um, the canon started to change and new voices came in, hmm. which is as it should have been. Uh, but I spent summers there because we all, were often moving when I was a kid. My dad would come up with a new line of work or a new strategy for work. And so reliably, my sister Morella and I, we'd end up at Uphill Farm in Conway, Massachusetts mm -hmm. and with my uh, two grandparents, Adie and Archie. They were not grandma and grandpa. Uh -huh. uh, they were Adie and Archie, and they um, we ate with the cook in the kitchen and we could go to the uh, pool at certain hours and we needed to be very careful about our prepositions and how we stated things mm -hmm. clearly precisely with no vague terms so mm. it got me thinking about language yes at a very early age at a very early yes. age yeah in fact I couldn't get to the dining room where the grown-ups ate until I was able to recite Kublai Khan in its entirety, wow. to my grandfather's satisfaction. Wow. How long did that take you? I think it took a summer, and I was mixed about whether I actually wanted to join them, because the yeah. advantage of eating in the kitchen was I could eat and watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> that is a toss-up when yeah. you're a kid. Right. And so um, so you went through high school, and you, you were um, attracted to being a lawyer. You were thinking about being a lawyer. Right, right. I, in fact, I was able, I went to the meeting school, which is no longer with us, over in Ringe, mm -hmm. New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And for my senior year, I was able to do an intercession project. So I worked with Legal Aid in New Haven, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And I had lived in New Haven prior, um, earlier in my life. So I had some connections there. And mm -hmm. It was fascinating, and I wanted to work for legal aid, and I wanted mm -hmm. to right the wrongs, and, but uh, that didn't work out. And you didn't get a lot of family support on that either, did you? No. Um, my grandfather, who was pretty much the brains of the entire family, mm -hmm. um, he made all the big decisions. When my father took me, uh, this was not during the summer, this was a, a random visit to meet the, the great, to talk to the great grandfather, the great man. And I explained to him that I wanted to be a lawyer. Mm. And he said that he, uh, he told my father, he didn't speak directly to me, but I was sitting next to my father, so I heard it, <laughs> that um, uh, women could not be good lawyers. Wow. And so he would not support that. Wow. And that was game over in some ways. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. That's such a difference in generations. Right. And also, I mean, you know, I think for many of us our, my age, um, we know that name and know that he was a writer and that mm -hmm. he won three Pulitzer Prizes. Right. But he was also the right. librarian of Con first librarian of Congress right. and was an assistant to the Secretary of State. Is yep. that correct? That's yeah. right. And so you didn't pursue law, but you did end up at Hampshire College. I went there because I think that was, um, my parents felt okay about me going there because Archie was part of it. He s helped start it. He did. Um, but that did not work out well for me. I, I came out of a Quaker high school where we took uh, the anti-war movement very seriously. We were suspicious of imperialism. We thought America had imperialist overtones. Um, and I, I wasn't necessarily part of any of the big liberation movements at the time. It's not as if I was a feminist or something of that sort. Yeah. But a, a, a sense that simplicity was better than uh, grandiosity. Mm. And grandiosity often took us in bad ways. Mm -hmm. So um, I went to Hampshire, and at that time, it seemed way too privileged, elite, mm -hmm. and a lot of drugs. I mean, I'm not against drugs, but there was a lot of like cocaine, and I yeah. just thought 
this is too much for me. Yeah. So I went to Costa Rica and went to a Quaker community and lived in the cloud forest, no electricity, oh, wow. worked in a lecheria. Uh -huh. When I was there, age, I guess I was 18, 19, I was 19 years old, and the Costa Ricans could not understand why I was not married and why I didn't have any kids. Turns out I'm very suggestible. <laughs> I thought, yeah, I don't know that either. And I came back to the United States, I married my high school boyfriend, and um, so I went down that path, uh -huh. and pretty soon thereafter I had kids, so yeah, yeah. It, was, it was, and we didn't have enough money for me to finish my degree. And was, was that when you became a paralegal? So then, that turned out to be a very effective way to earn a living. Yeah. One night, sorry, one year of night school, get this, one year of night school, you could get a certificate as a paralegal. Department of Labor saw a big expansion in the legal sector. I looked at that handout and thought, that's the way I'm going to make more money because mm. two kids, um, my husband had a degree in classics, but that wasn't paying anything. Mm -hmm. So I decided to, to do that and we moved to Keene, New Hampshire, mm -hmm. and I got a job as a paralegal, one of the first paralegals in Keene. Really? Yeah. So it was brand new yeah. um, job, uh -huh. type of job. And, and did, that, did that satisfy you a little bit for your... I like a lawyer. I, well, I loved hanging out with the lawyers. Yeah. I love doing motions and briefs. Uh -huh. um, I also like their attention to language. This is a little bit going back to yes. to uh, hanging out with my grandfather during the summer months. Is you're very careful when you're crafting a motion mm -hmm. with the terms you use, mm -hmm. any agreements that you make, and you need to be thinking about how the words could be used in the most negative light. Mm. So you may have all sorts of aspirations for what this contract should mean, but you have to be thinking about what the implications are of your word. Right, right. So that was terrific mm -hmm. in terms of training. So you were in Keene for a while, but you, you came to Brad at some point. In the yeah, so that was another one of those mysterious things. So a set of circumstances of, of achieving great heights in my career and difficult emotional circumstances. I was overstressed. Anyway, long story short, I had to completely remake who I was. It was hmm. one of those instances. Mm -hmm. And either you could call it a nervous breakdown or you could call it a gift from the universe or whatever that I just stopped being able to function at this really high level of closing, closing, taking care of kids, mm -hmm. worrying about could we flip the house or not. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I thought the only way I'll stay alive is by dancing. That was an old love. And I took a, da a dance class at the Brattleboro School of Dance mm -hmm. and saw Alison Mott, except her name was Alison Knaut, in a ballet class. Mm -hmm. Anyway, my life changed. Wow. You turned it around. I, yeah. tell, I mean, yeah. we've been together now. 20 years, over 20 uh -huh. years. That was around the time you, you entered the adult degree program? Right. Finally, when I was divorced, head of household, two kids, and had a loving partner, I found the adult degree program. Thank you, Tom Yan, for yeah. being part of this. Yes. Uh, the reason that I have this the professor of politics. That's so great. Yeah, is, it, Tom is helps so many people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of amazing. Yeah. Yeah, that's what that great. allowed to do. And it's also a great program. The program oh, itself yeah. is wonderful. Yeah. I mean, they had this understanding that the people, they were, we were older uh, students, and mm -hmm. we came because we had some ideas that we kept having to put on the back burner, mm -hmm. or some mm -hmm. uh, notion about what we could offer to the world, but we'd never had a chance to try. Right, right. And the Adult Degree program, it was fantastic. Uh, Bernice Menace, there were so many people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Sarah Mitchell. Yes. Yeah. Fabulous I've, mentors. I've heard, I've heard a lot of those names. And yeah. you also got involved in um, the Women's Crisis Center and the Land Trust and yeah. Yeah, a few other programs right. like that. Right, right, yeah. Um, at the time when I was at the adult degree program, this you, uh, people who've been here a while will remember uh, the slaying of Judith Hart Fournier. Mm -hmm. And I used my student status, that ability to write, to do a lot of thinking and interviewing and writing about and organizing around uh, what happens when a community suffers that kind of violence. Yes. And the perpetrator, Bob Sawyer, was known yep. throughout the community. Yep. Judith Hart Fournier was a reporter. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. um, so I was very interested in how to resolve that. That was also a very powerful article. I remember that, actually. Well, we remember that time, but I remember you writing about it, and I looked it up and read it again. Yeah. It was very powerful, and, but also what I noticed, which was really 
amazing in light of the way a lot of news is today is that it was very, um, it, it was very even. Mm -hmm. You know, you were really reporting, mm -hmm. but you were, there was a lot of heart in it, and mm -hmm. you were talking about the focus was the community. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of these very loud and mm -hmm. and very difficult things that we were dealing with. Right. So yeah, no, it was right. very powerful. So your writing then, were you doing other writing? Uh, I had this little zine I put out called Out of the Kitchen, which was a woman's zine. Uh -huh. um, and I was writing for some more feminist slash lesbian um, um, periodicals, something yeah. of that sort. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, every time I think I've found a group that totally understands how to do things well, it turns out they're just as human as any other group. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, working at the adult degree program, Bernice Menes really encouraged people to push on ideas and get new perspectives. Uh -huh. She was also working in a prison at the same time she was teaching here in Brattleboro. Mm -hmm. That's yes. where I began to think about what do we really mean to say and when can those words be transformative and not just reinforcing a narrow perspective that thinks it has all the right answers. Yeah. And I think that really segues into, um, you know, in talking to you, realizing that one of the threads that really comes through here mm -hmm. is really finding some kind of a common language, or at least mm -hmm. finding a way to talk to each other mm -hmm. so that we are talking about critical issues, but in a way where we don't make each other wrong. Yes. Yeah. That's it. Right. Um, so one way to do that, you, you mentioned debate mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. introduction. Uh, in my classes, I generally have debates, and the propositions can be very, very broad, using terms that oftentimes get used, mm -hmm. but then it, within the context of the debate, you have to actually lean on it a little bit mm. and think about competing interpretations. So, for instance, um, one we did at Marlboro in the fall of last year was, this house believes that the, that the Constitution reinforces white supremacy. And um, so there's a big term in there, white supremacy. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? And different, and you have to be able to argue for it or against mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And what kind of evidence will you use to make that claim? Um, and is that going to always be the best term if it's such an expansive term mm -hmm. or such a polarizing term? Right, right. Um, because you have to convince the audience of judges. And I go around campus and say, want to come see a debate? Want to come see a debate? Mm -hmm. So who knows who's going to be sitting in there? It's not necessarily just progressive college students. That's right. Uh, who will be in the classroom that they need to persuade. Yeah. So I find that's a really useful way uh -huh. to get people to get off their soap, what do they call them? Soapbox. Soapbox, yes. right. Get yes. off the soapbox yeah. and make it sudsy and say, is this the kind of fully ex you know, fully <laughs> yeah. I want or is this doing something right. terrible? Yeah. But you're hearing, but in hearing both sides and that kind of evenness, right. it kind of allows a, a, an openness for right. your own head to sort of get around the ideas. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you're, you're using this with the kids at Marlboro mm -hmm. a lot, mm -hmm. and you've also done public forums. Mm, at Putney, at yeah. the Putney Public mm -hmm. Library. Yep. Starting last summer, this was great. The trustee, uh, Janice, oops, forgot her last name, and Emily the Librarian. Emily Zervis, yes. Uh, Emily Zervis had an idea that after the election, that people are having a very hard time talking to each other. Yeah. And um, how could they come up with a forum in which anybody would be interested in coming because, and they f came up with the idea that everybody would be interested in the Constitution. <laughs> so, yep. um, and that we should do a series that had something to do with the Constitution, mm -hmm. which I thought was a brilliant idea. Yeah, yeah. And I um, worked on, I, I thought, well, we have a limited amount of time. This is, even though it's a tiny little document, there's actually a lot in here. Mm -hmm. So we decided to go through the Bill of Rights one month, one right. I think that a couple of years ago, this would have sounded like kind of a dry and boring right. forum, right? right? But now right. you're talking about what we see every day. Yeah. And I've heard that, that these talks that you've given have been really dynamic. People have really enjoyed them a lot. Well, the exciting part about uh, following the amendments is the Supreme Court has had a lot to say about most of them. Mm. Um, and that means there's good arguments on both sides. Mm -hmm. It became an opportunity to not just go yes, at each other. That's right. At it. That's right. And again, you know, I think it goes a little bit back to um, 
uh, having to, to memorize Kuval Khan, yeah. <laughs> right? You know, yeah. something you didn't necessarily right. want to do, but it was language. Yes. And also, yes. um, you know, I, I think back to, you know, talking about uh, being a Quaker, or mm. at least, you know, mm. being in a Quaker school where mm. they had certain ways of going about things that may have informed right. you. Um, right. And then the whole legal thing, right. you know, as well. Uh -huh. And so, um, when it's nice you... nice you're making these connections. <laughs> I think that's really insightful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you're standing back listening I'll say, to yeah, me. Yeah, I'm listening and then to you. Yeah, yeah. You, right. Then right. all these other uh, possibilities. Yeah, well, that's one thing about doing a half hour show. You know, you get to squeeze a lot of things in, and so you're kind of trying to make connections as you go. One of the strategies that you um, have talked about and that you use in the classroom is the commonplace book and mm. the debate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just think it's fascinating. So yeah. if you could talk about that a little yeah. bit. Yeah, okay. So I'm so excited by the commonplace book. Yeah. Yeah. This is something that John Locke would have done. And it's slow. It is pre-modern. It is pre-technology. And I do this with the students at Marlboro, who usually are here with their phones. Do, 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 do. Well, we don't need these, because we have this much earlier device. I'll show you what it looks like. Um, people often buy moleskins, but you can use any kind of a um, writing journal. Mm -hmm. And this is how to organize your thoughts if the problem in life is you get so much information but that you can't organize mm -hmm. it, and that is increasingly true yes. in this digital age. So this becomes an intervention. When I'm reading something, and this is Stanley Fish, uh, Winning Arguments, which is a great book, I highly recommend it, I'll come across a passage and I'll just think that's the best thing ever. Mm -hmm. So I write down my passage here, mm -hmm. uh, go about a little bit longer, read, read, Little, here's another passage, another passage. So these are passages that I pulled out of the text that I want to hold on to. Yes. And then, on this side, I am reflecting on it. And I may have pulled it out because I completely loved it, but by the time I wrote it out by hand, uh -huh. hmm, maybe it's not the thing I thought it was. So this is a place over here to really reflect on the writing. Um, and then at the end, I have an index. So after a semester worth of reading and taking notes, if I'm trying to remember something, such as, I have to put on my glasses to even read this, but um, if I'm interested in the common rule of life or chastity, oh, 53, I was right, put down something about chastity, then um, that's how I can find it. And so is your index alphabetical? Yes. How do you, how do, you do that? How do so, you make it on, ongoing? Oh, OK. Uh, you you see? set it out in. Right. OK. So I don't know if your camera can connect this, but when I started, I have A, B, C, D, and right. then I fill it in with pencil. Gotcha. Um, and then you will come to the end of that book. Yes. And you, that book will have been filled. Right. Because have you ever had that feeling of, oh, two years ago I read this thing, and it was so important. Right. I can't remember where it is, but OK, I'm on to the next. Yeah. This is a way of uh, digesting, uh -huh. really chewing on it. Yes. And then, OK, this metaphor is now going to have to be put aside, because I don't want to say then you vomit up what you have. <laughs> but there's that sense of maybe building something that you've really yes. considered, uh -huh. and then you have access to it later. Yes. Without this, this I could throw away. Well, it's so interesting, though, because what you're talking about with this is you are also doing a, the kinesthetic piece here. You're writing things down. Right. Right? Whereas this, you're accessing it in a much much more ephemeral way. Yes. So, I mean, I find for myself, if I write a list, yeah, I'm much remember. more apt to remember it exactly. yeah, because of that. Yeah. So can you put that up against the debating that you do? Right. Because um, this is slow. This is this very is, slow. This is, this is much more ruminative. Yes, yeah. right. So in preparation for debate, students don't necessarily have to buy books for my class, but they need to keep this. And mm. this also helps with the high cost of everything. Um, so if prior to the debate, when you know what the proposition is going to be, um, you're able as students to go through this mm. and find, oh, so and this, uh, especially if they're taking a legal class, not only do I have entries with te um, passages from text, all sorts of texts, I also have, I have legal briefs. So if we're going to do a, um, a debate that has to do with Korematsu, say, which just got all this attention, yes. the Japanese internment, then they should have a legal brief that looks at the facts of the case, yeah. what were the legal reasonings, and what were the, ver what were the different opinions, uh -huh. and what were the key points of those different yeah. opinions. Yeah. 
So they may not be re-debating the actual case in front of the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. but we'll create a proposition that has something to do with executive powers and what are the limits of executive mm -hmm. powers mm -hmm. in wartime mm -hmm. so that they're needing to pull out from here passages right. they already and have. They do have it at their fingertips because they have an index. And they have an index. And so what's the response? Well, at first when I, pres I learned this at a conference, right? We go off to conferences, we learn things. I learned it from somebody who teaches at the Naval Academy, I oh, think. So I brought this back to Marlboro College with all the anarchists and the, the uh, uh -huh. very progressive types. And I said, this is something they did. John Locke did this. Uh, maybe Montaigne did this. Who are these people? Uh, and I learned about it at the Naval Academy. <laughs> so at first, not a lot of interest, a lot of suspicion. Yeah. I think my colleagues thought it was crazy, with the exception of two colleagues, Amr Latif and um, William Edelglass seemed somewhat interested in this. Mm -hmm. And so we started to use it with our students. And some students said, they're reasonable. They said, I don't write by hand. I don't know how to write by hand. I said, well, if you slow down, you may have a better educational experience. And writing by hand will teach you to slow down. Uh -huh. So cognitive science has yeah. shown yeah. kinesthetic reasons. Yeah. Uh, k there's kinesthetic um, reasons for why this could be beneficial. Mm -hmm. And some students continue to say, no, I can't do this. I have a, you need to make an accommodation. Uh -huh. Fine. If you want to type it out, then cut it, glue stick it in. Ah, oh, great. So <laughs> make it material. Yeah. Make it yours. Uh -huh. Make it something that you still need uh -huh. to slow down. If you must use these keyboards, go ahead. Uh -huh. And then, and now it's amazing how many students, when they catch on to this, particularly students who are feeling overwhelmed, anxious, too many things they have to keep yeah. track of. This organizes them. It's, it's so quiet. Yeah, that's so it's it's so interesting. It's it's a it's a real tool. It's a it really different is. kind of tool. Yeah. But a lot of kids have been fine with it and they yes. yeah. Um I would say attendance in my classes have gone up since I've done this. Really? Also because uh, they evaluate themselves. Mm -hmm. I have a rubric that says what are the different components that need to be there. Uh -huh. Um I other faculty members may not do this, but I don't actually take their books and collect them and read them. I feel that it's theirs. They need to do mm -hmm, this. Mm -hmm. And I can see that they've done it in the midst of a class discussion mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because people are always reading out of their commonplace books. That's where we're having a conversation about contracts or something of that sort and their importance and yeah, John Locke. Yeah. You can pull out your little uh -huh, passage. Uh -huh. And it informs their debates. Yes, and then they've got those. Yep. Um, and if they're doing a debate together, then they have different things that they've drawn on. Uh -huh. So their legal briefs may look a little bit different. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I ask um, before the debate other students who aren't actually debating to look through their commonplace book for other arguments that they would want to use as a, during a cross-examination. Uh -huh. So they go as interlopers as the teams are preparing mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. questions that they've gathered from their commonplace books. Mm -hmm. That sounds fascinating. It sounds yeah. very fascinating. Yeah. I like yeah. it that it's pre-modern too, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. And that you're having good results yes. as well. Yeah. yeah. Now that's very exciting. So as you were getting more into the legal world, mm. you know, n not not becoming a litigator, mm. but you, uh, you came across obviously opposing Mm. arguments all the time. Right, right. And so how did you move, move into that and, and not only come up with the, um, uh, the commonplace book, but um, just your thinking. How, how was your thinking informed? Right. Um, well, it was very interesting when I was, this is around the time of the Judith Hart Fournier murder. Mm -hmm. So it was part of a group in town um, that was loosely affiliated with the, at the time, Women's Crisis Center of how could we stop this from happening again and mm -hmm. wanting more state action. Mm -hmm. And I went up to Montpelier and spoke in favor of the Violence Against Women Act. Mm -hmm. And my main complaint was that it was called the Violence Against Women Act, and yet the terms of it, uh, which were about heightened, um, heightened prosecutions, mandatory sentences, it had that kind of language mm -hmm. in it, very mm -hmm. punitive. My complaint was that it wasn't targeting, it wasn't um, just targeting men, mm -hmm. which you can't do. Right, right, right. That's against the 14th Amendment mm -hmm. and all sorts of other things. Mm -hmm. But that's what I, at the time, wanted. And then I saw how it played out, and I began to think that maybe some of the people who were pushing back against the Violence Against Women Act, who I saw as defending the patriarch, 
we're actually raising a reasonable objections to criminalizing mm. uh, more behavior. Mm -hmm. And was it necessarily helpful to put batterers in jail? Or what was happening a lot at first was dual arrest. Both parents are in jail. Mm. Kids are ending up in foster. Mm. So I, be, you know, I began to see how political movements, God bless them, can want things that if they feel that the opposition is their enemy and they stop listening, mm. we are actually worse off. Mm -hmm. And I actually have a lot of um, sadness, I guess is one word, regret that um, I put a lot of energy into passing something that didn't solve the problem and increase the power of the criminal legal system. Mm -hmm. And that was not necessarily good for families mm -hmm. or communities that have um, um, not good relationships with police. Mm -hmm. So uh, it really opened my eyes to the very person that you may think is your enemy or is a reactionary. And then mm -hmm. I'll say this for a lot of, you know, I like to hear what conservatives have to say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I don't believe that progressives are 100% right. Yeah. Yeah. And so how can we find ways to get those arguments in the same room at the same time? Right. And also because uh, so many of them are timely. And so, you know, you, a movement comes together and there's a trajectory. Yeah. But very often there are all kinds of things that come in to, to switch things up. And if yeah. you're not listening to each other, which is what we are discovering, yeah. if you're not listening to each other, you're not going to really get too far Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's so true. Yes. So that that was a bit of a... I would imagine that would be a bit of a discovery, you know, to bring yeah. into all that you do. Right. Yeah. 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 That, that's what propelled me to go to graduate school. Mm -hmm. was, mm -hmm. It was watching what, how the Violence Against Women Act mm -hmm. actually played out. Yeah. I thought I need to go off to yeah. graduate school and really make sense uh -huh. of this. Uh -huh. You lived in town for a while, and now you're living out in the country, and you yeah. have a goat farm. Yes. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Which is. Uh, Animals teach us so much about politics. <laughs> uh, we have. Uh, Do go on. <laughs> well, you know, I used to think of um, chickens as really lovely creatures, and 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 the whole bucolic farm. Uh -huh. No, truly, animals, uh, chickens in particular, they're brutal. They have a pecking order, and Literally, the rooster yeah. wants to dominate. And uh, Aristotle used to call us featherless bipeds, human beings or chickens without feathers, basically. And so sometimes when I think of the, mis the mess in the world, that can actually be consoling. Because we really are. We have the same instincts. Mm -hmm. We have pecking orders. We have a strong desire to dominate. We want to rule the roost, right? I mean, all yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah. All those there. things, yeah. And so to, to look back at human beings and our conduct, I mean, uh, sometimes I think of our current president, and uh, right, he was duly elected, that's how it works, played the game and he won. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I hear my rooster in his terms and I think, yep, that's, we wanted a rooster or <laughs> you needed a rooster. enough people. Yeah, I know it yeah. wasn't a popular majority, but through the electoral yeah. system, yeah. the voters wanted a rooster yeah. Yeah. and that's what we've got. Yeah. But if I think of it as a rooster as opposed to the rise of fascism, I have a lot more space in my brain to think. <laughs> that's right. And that seems to be one thing you do a lot, Meg, is trying to help people create more space in their brains oh. so they can accommodate these kinds of things. Wow. Yeah, looking at it that way makes a big difference. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, the way one gets things into their brains, whether it's by writing things down or yes. it's visual, it's different for everybody. Right. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. This was delightful. It was wonderful. It was really was delightful. Yeah, it was. It was great to have you on. I love it. And thanks to all of you for being with us today for a lively discussion. We didn't even know it was going to get so political, but it was a lot of fun. So tune in next time. We will be here with Here We Are. Mm -hmm.